Okay, so this is Elminster Q&A. And Elminster lives in the sorting hat. No, uh, the hat. <laughs> and I live in here most of the time. So if you'd like Ed to answer a question, just say so. If you'd like Elminster to answer a question, just say so. I have to warn you, Elminster's far ruder than I am, <laughs> and he's far more flippant. You might not get the answer you were hoping for. Okay, great. With that said, hi, welcome to Elminster and Ed Q&A. So the format of this is instead of my warbling on about all sorts of important things like how I powdered my nose this morning, we go straight to question and answers. So I talk about what you want to hear about. Boy, I sound impressive. Let's, let's, let's do that. Yes, that's better. So, hi, please, somebody ask Ed or Elminster a question. Yes. Question for it. Question for Ed. Uh, beyond the fact that they won't let you publish any more books, what is the most difficult thing that you've had with the Forgotten Realms? The most difficult thing that I've had with the Forgotten Realms is the same problem that TSR had with Greyhawk and Gary Gygax. I am the bottleneck because everybody wants to know about so many things in the setting. It's a big world, and there's only one of me, which is why teams of writers, teams of designers, and the moment you have more than one of anybody, the number one human problem rears its head, communications. And it's times when there are contingency glitches or misunderstandings and upsets just because people didn't communicate properly for whatever reason. Um, so though that's my one problem. It seems like right now people are going in two different directions in this kind of writing, right? You're going very heavy systems uh, directions where you are essentially generating as much data as possible to fuel uh, the kinds of things that we're trying to do, or you're going in narrative direction where you're doing either long form content or other things that are more narratively structured gaming. Um, from your side of, of thinking about the production of those elements, what do you prefer? Oh, I've always preferred the narrative um, to more and more and more data. Uh, on the other hand, because I've been doing this for 56 years now or whatever, you know, a long time, um, I've piled up lots and lots and lots and lots of datum. Um, but uh, I would always go for story over everything else, which is why Elminster and Volo and Laryl and everybody else who's been our narrator about the realms is unreliable because they're all telling stories. And they may be spinning the truth. They may not know the truth and be making it up out of their rear ends as they talk to you. Or they may be deliberately propagandizing because, say, they serve the goddess of magic, so they want Mister to look big and important in everything they say. So, yeah, it's always storytelling. I'm always narrative first because what matters in the end is the story. The, the only thing that makes that tricky for games is that we're theoretically playing a role-playing game where theoretically the players control the story and can do anything they want. So it becomes difficult if you write a narrative and you just want it to be a linear, no, you're, you're going to turn left. When you go into the bank to rob it, you're going to turn left. And you have to assume they're going to turn right, run back out again, swing from the ceiling because they're gamers. You know, <laughs> so yeah. Thank you. This is for Ed and Elminster. I'd kind of like to hear both perspectives. <laughs> what is your favorite place like in the Forgotten Realms? And is it the same as Ed and as Elminster? My favorite place is, I, I hate choosing favorites always because it's favorites for what? Um, the most beautiful place is the headwaters of the Unicorn Run in the high forest. Gorgeous scenery, tranquil, beautiful. Um, serene and hopefully you can enjoy it in solitude i mean that's you know um places i'd like to visit um 
Cormier and the Dales are inherently safer if they're not being invaded than Waterdeep, but their Waterdeep has the better restaurants and the more fun, you know. Now, um, so it's what you want for it. And <clears throat> Helminster, I'm sure, has a different answer. I like everywhere in the realms all at once, <laughs> but I don't like to enjoy them alone. If you take my meaning. <laughs> Hi, uh, so I just finished Ben Riggs' book, Slaying the Dragons, and uh, something that came up was how Forgotten Realms was TSR's ideal because it was so complete and vast and flushed out when they first uh, began talking with you. Could you tell us a little bit about just how all of that came forward? How long had you been working on it? What was that creative process kind of like? Because Forgotten Realms is massive and, and so well thought out. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I fooled you. No, I, 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 um, okay. I started working on the Forgotten Realms when I was five years old, which was 10 years before anything called D&D &D existed. So it was a story world for me to set stories in to entertain myself because although my father had purchased over a misspent life just about every sort of genre fiction you could enjoy and all the heroic fantasy back to translations, okay, I'd read it all by the time I was five. That's what I did. I sat at home and read. And I would go pounding up the stairs and ask my dad for sequels. And my dad would try and get rid of me in a hurry and say, uh, if you want more like that, son, um, that author died in 1938. You're going to have to write it yourself. And I go, okay, and go pounding back down the stairs and start writing. So that's how I started with the realms. And I was entertaining myself for 10 years before D&D came along. And I started putting articles set in the realms in Dragon purely because I'm, I'm actually a very shy, retiring, embarrassed in public guy. I just had to learn to overcome that about 50 years ago <laughs> and make up for it. Um, so it felt very arrogant to me to write something for a magazine that says, hi, my name's Ed Greenwood and I thought of a new way of rolling dice that none of you idiots have thought of before. Um, and also, I was acutely aware of the fact that every player in those days read Dragon. If they couldn't buy it, they went and read a friend's copy, but all the players read Dragon. So if you wrote an article that said, that had a mini dungeon, and it says there are eight orcs in room three, and their hit dice are, and they're sitting on a treasure of, every player knew that going in. But if you had an unreliable narrator, so you had... It's rumored that orcs are hanging out in those old ruins, but I don't credit myself. <laughs> then you built in plausible deniability, so your dungeon master can change anything, and so you know you can't trust anything you read in Dragon, so now you're engaged at the gaming table. You're in the game. You're, you're role-playing, hopefully. Um, and I had written several years' worth of stuff referencing the realms, in Dragon, Jeff Grubb was a staff designer at TSR, and he'd written a white paper um, just for in internal company use, saying a proposal for a unified game world for the second edition of the game. And this was because Gary Gygax had been forced out of TSR, and they didn't want to give him another penny, so no more Greyhawk. So they built their own world, Dragonlance. It took 200 people and two years of company time and money to build one world for one epic story that was very, very, very similar to the quest story of Lord of the Rings. So what do you do for an encore? Let's do the other side of the world, which is literally what they did. But they needed a kitchen sink world. They needed, and this was what the realms was tailor-made. It was the world of a thousand, thousand stories, not one big story. And they already had an orphaned, 
TSR UK campaign that Doug Niles had written from for them called Albion, which was Celtic England fantasy version. So they sank my moonshades and that became the, the moonshades, published moonshades. They already had the desert or desolation modules with Egyptian pyramids. They had to dump them somewhere in this new world. So they wanted a world that could encompass all those things. So Jeff Grubb called me at the public library that I worked at and said, do you have a complete detailed world at home or are you making it up as you go along? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, call this number after 5 p.m. And I said, what do I win? <laughs> and he said, this is my boss's number. He wants to talk to you about something. My boss's name is Mike Dobson. So if a lady answers, ask for Mike, literally. And they wanted that off work time, away from the building. So if the conversation didn't go well, it just never happened. But it did go well because he says, we'd like to buy your world. Are you interested in selling it? Yes, I said. He says, so we should sort of talk terms. I'm, I can't, like, I can, I can bind the company, but I can't really. So how much were you thinking? And I said, I don't care. Because I wanted color maps of the worlds that didn't have my blue pe pencil crayon markers in all the seas. And I figured if they publish their own, I'll get nice published maps. So I said, yes, because I'm a gamer. <laughs> That's how the realms came along. So it was detailed because I'd been telling all sorts of stories for years because it was a story world first. But... To keep myself honest as a storyteller, in the same way that Don Pendleton, when he was writing all those executioner books, he got into the habit of actually walking through the abandoned warehouses or rail yards, firing, imaginary firing, um, to do his gunfights so he wouldn't have guys firing 22 times without reloading and all that stuff. And then you could make it from here to there. It was humanly possible. Instead of just writing it that way and having somebody go, come on. So to keep myself honest, I adopted the monster manual and then the player's handbook, which was Jack Vance's magic system from the dying earth used by Gary with Jack's permission, but it was a perfect way of ordering magic. So it has limitations. I mean, it was one perfect way of ordering magic, but it, it worked for me keeping myself honest as a writer. So it was a detailed D and D world and it was huge and so on because I've been storytelling for all those decades before D&D came along. Ta -da. Boy, I'm long-winded. <laughs> Hi, Ed, I'm Shiraz from Toronto. Hi, yes. Uh, um, I've you literally answered everything I wanted to ask you in that brilliant answer. Uh, so I'll ask you this. Um, since you like the Dungeons and Dragons movies, so just following up on what do you think, did they consult you at all? Or did you have any sort of involvement in that, you know, sorting questions out or anything? I that had nature. no direct involvement. They consulted me in four or five roundabout ways that I didn't realize at the time. First of all, the guys writing the the D and D movie were D and D fans, and they've been reading all the lore and they've been putting it together and they've been trying to decide what would fit inside two hours of running time for years. And then they secretly consulted me by asking questions as fans on Candlekeep and Twitter. <laughs> And just like I would answer for any of you as, you know, Realms fans, D&D players, I answered them. And then they, then they were filming. And they were filming at Alnick Castle in um, Norfolk, Northumberland County in uh, England. And COVID hit the set. So they were stuffed into their trailers for 14 days and boxed food was brought to the trailers. So they did what actors and Hollywood types do, say, yeah, I need drink. Strong drink, lots of drink. Um, so I got a weird phone call at about two in the morning. <laughs> uh, Hugh Grant was drinking in the set director's trailer and they'd obviously been drinking for a while. Hi, are you the Ed Greenwood? I'm Ann Ed Greenwood. 
Are you the d d at Greenwood? Yes, I suppose I am. Great. What's d d <laughs> I think it's a little late to ask that question. But, <laughs> but still, was I consulted directly? The answer is no. Was I consulted in roundabout ways? Lots, yes. Um, the only person credited, um, well, okay, all the people who worked in Hollywood who are unionized got credited. It goes on for seven minutes. The only um, game advisor credited is Kim Mohan. Um, my editor at Dragon, one of my closest friends who died four months before the movie was released. So I guess from their point of view, it was fairly safe to credit him because he wasn't going to be suing them for money, right? <laughs> um, nobody else got credited. But yeah, I was sort of consulted. And I don't mind because um, I think they gave us a good movie and that's what I wanted. I'm not there for the glory because Hollywood discovered me 50 years too late. This body was gorgeous when I was 17. I think you're still gorgeous. So, in the early, early days of tabletop role playing games, a lot of the conventions that we think of now in terms of spells were originally like Star Trek uh, game systems. Um, did you? ever when you were first building your um, world think about doing it in a different genre or a different setting? No, not really, because I was too young to think about um, certainly not in a, on a marketing or publication because I wasn't thinking about that. The Forgotten Realm started when I was five years old I was in, they, they pulled people out of kin, uh, kindergarten who were really bored and acting out because they were bored. And they put us in what they called a kitty class. They were experimenting with everything in education. Well, they still are, but I mean, um, this was the early sixties. So, Hey man, peace out. Um, they were experimenting with everything. And one of them was a uh, kitty classes. So. We had kitty class geography and boy, was I bored. Um, cause I'd already learned all this stuff years before reading my father's books. And I had a daydream in class, which was, um, this gorgeous woman sitting alone by a campfire with a cloak wrapped around her harping. She's camped for the night. She's made this campfire. She's in the middle of the woods somewhere and there's softly falling picture postcard, Christmas card, snow, and there's beast eyes gathered to listen to her from all the way through the trees. And she's harping away and she has silver hair, not old lady hair, metallic silver hair, long silver hair. And this gorgeous woman comes out of the woods in full plate armor with a fur cloak around her shoulders, who also has metallic silver hair. And I'm five years old. I haven't discovered girls yet, you know. I'm not like, I'm not going, oh, oh, oh. I, I'm, I'm going, who are these ladies? What's going on? I need to know more. Now, later on, I figured out that was Storm Silverhand harping and in the, in the high forest. And that was Dove Silverhand, her sister, who was attracted to her by the sound of her harping. Hey, I found my sis. All right. Um, but I didn't know that yet then. So I went on a big, long journey of writing stuff to find out. And I was... I was a lonely kid because my mother died and I was being raised by grandmas and aunties who were great and they were salt of the earth, but they were grandmas and aunties. The aunties didn't read. They could read. They didn't read. The grandma read to run a business. They didn't read for pleasure. My dad who was largely absent because he threw himself into his job, which was installing radar all over the place to stop the, the, the dirty menace from coming over the pole and nuking us all. Um, he threw himself into his job out of grief, so he was rarely home. But he said, son, you can read anything in my den. Don't rip anything. 
don't stain anything and put it back where you found it. He was great dad. He would, he'd tell my sisters he'd leave stacks of wood in a toolbox and he'd leave them there beside these little girls and say, when I come back, I don't want to see that any of it's been touched. And then he'd go out of the room and close the door, knowing that they'd be attacking it. And I said, you know, he would, you know, but I mean, so that's how it all proceeded. I wasn't thinking of publishing and I wasn't thinking of genres. I was writing what most moved me, which was vaguely European, you know, Robin Hood and Sherwood Forest, guys in armor. And of course, later on, much later on, when Excalibur came along and all these guys in chromed armor are galloping through the rose petals, it's like, yay, that's, that's my jam. It was, you know, um, and crumbling castles and all that, you know, that was what most spoke to me in all the books of my father's den. So that's the genre I chose. I read everything. I loved the Lensman space operas. You know, I was enjoying space opera long before Star Wars ever came along. Um, Star Trek, well, here's the problem. I grew up in Canada. I knew Bill Shatner because I was an usher at the Stratford Festival and he was playing spear carriers. And he was actually quite a good actor. James T. Kirk is a role. Bill Shatner by himself does not speak with each word being its own sentence. <laughs> you know, um, that's James T. Kirk. Um, but I mean, it was like, this is fun. Star Trek was put on late at night because it was weird and little boys have curfews and fathers who work in all this stuff tinker their own TV sets together. So late at night is when you get radio interference from around the globe and you suddenly find yourself watching a Ukrainian cooking show. <laughs> Damn it, where's my Star Trek? <laughs> so. Hi, and so, so first of all, thank you for gifting us Forgotten Realms. This is like an incredible universe for us to, to all live in. This You're is, very welcome. Um, that being said, I really, really enjoyed reading your Band of Four novels, mm -hmm. and that was just pure fun, you know. And I, I'm just curious where the inspiration for that came from, because it just seems just extremely, just, just, yeah. The real world answer for that is that Brian Thompson was head of books at TSR. When Hasbro bought Wizards of the Coast, um, Brian became a friend. He phoned all of us weekly. The phone would ring and I'd pick it up and he'd say, hello, great man. <laughs> that was my phone call. Elaine Cunningham got, hello, great lady. And we, we thought, we vaguely thought about switching phone numbers, so. <laughs> The, for a while. But anyway, we, we talk weekly. And he phoned all of us the week Hasbro bought um, the Wizards of the Coast machine and said, start looking for other work. Hasbro doesn't publish books. They've killed the book publishing division at everything they've ever swallowed. They're going to do it here. And sure enough, they let him go when they moved everything to Renton and he immediately got a job at Tor Books because Tom Doherty was a friend and wanted to publish more fantasy and Brian was a really good editor. So he poached all of, yeah. So he poached all of us and he said, Hey Ed, I want you to write some books for me. I said, cool. He says, fantasy books. I said, cooler. He says, so I'd take the four core D and D character classes, fighter, thief, you know, that um, write me a, a story in which they all appear. Okay. I can do that. Can I have it by Thursday? <laughs> this is how publishing works. And I said, sure, but I get to choose the Thursday. <laughs> So he says, look, look, just phone this number. The man who answers the phone will be your agent of record on this book. You are going to be rich beyond the dreams of avarice. And I said, really? He says, no, but well, you're going to actually get paid money for once. <laughs> oh, good. I'm, I'm in. So I wrote the band of four books and that's how it happened. And 
It was purely like, oh, I get to write fantasy. And it's not set in the realms, so I can do my own thing and just have fun. I'm going to tell a buddy movie, like a buddy story. And I'm going to start from the point of view of a Mutt and Jeff character who just been demobbed as soldiers on the losing side in a war. And they are desperate for food and money because, and they, it rubs them the wrong way to steal food from their own people they were fighting to defend. And that's what they've been reduced to doing, stealing chickens and stuff. And they hit upon this idea, there's this really wealthy, rich bitch, you know, the, the daughter of one of the lords. And we know she has like dresses made of jewels, this huge wardrobe. We'll go rob her. Well, she lives in a castle. It's on an island. And it's only when they're like in mid-rubbery when they discover that <laughs> she's powerful at magic. <laughs> and she has them in the palm of her hand. And that's when the story suddenly gets interesting because she feels trapped by her father. She wants out. And she sees these two vagabonds as her way out of being a bird in a gilded cage. So it start, the fun starts. And I thought, I'm just going to have fun. Because it's not the realms, I don't have to worry about canon and matching lore and everything. I can just finally let story ride, and that'll be my considerations. And so that was the band of four books. And the, my problem with Tor is that Brian died. So Tor went silent and dark for a year until David Hartwell phoned me out of the blue and said, hi, I've inherited all of Brian's unstable of writers. Here's the sort of books I'm thinking would fit into our line, blah, 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 blah. Which one of them would you like to do? And I said, all of them. And he said, no, 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 you got to pick. Uh, oh, okay, this one. And in, in this case, it was like doing two drow books that weren't drow books, as in they weren't D&D &D drow. So I did those. And then David Hartwell said, I've got a new direction. I want you to do steampunk. So I wrote The Iron Assassin, and then David Hartwell died. And I, I reached the conclusion, I've got to stop writing for editors. <laughs> I'm killing the great editors of the world. Um, so that's how the Band of Four came to be, and that's why they stopped so far. So far. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of books, I am curious, Ed, which books um, written by other authors but set in the realms have you enjoyed? I pretty much enjoyed all of them. Uh -huh. My favorites, the ones that speak to me, are books like Elf Shadow by Elaine Cunningham because... I thought she was reading my mind when I, when I read it. It's, just, it's perfect. This woman gets the realms. This is the realms. So I can finally read realms books that I didn't write. Um, as Bob deepened from the, the Crystal Shard in that first trilogy, which um, I was part of the approvals process for and the lore, so I was sitting there reading. In those days, manuscripts were individual sheets of paper big stacks like this. So you had 600 pages in your lap. Um, I soon learned to lie on the floor to take the weight. And I was reading, reading, you know, like that and saying, no, you can't do that, Bob. No, got that wrong. You know, but it, so, um, but when he then got to Homeland, when he was giving us what Menzo Branson was like, and it was like, oh, oh, this is wonderful. This is a great addition to the realms. This is perfect for what Gary said in the original um, Vault of the Drow modules, but it's something I didn't write. So this is bring new, yeah. Um, I mentioned City of the Dead before by Rosemary Jones. Aaron Evans or Brimstone Angels novels and The Godcatcher before that, gorgeous. Eric Scott DeBee gave us some of the funniest book, Down Shadow. Um, yeah, I, I recommend that for, you know, how a... What happens when you're a male character in Chase the Ladies? <laughs> and three of them show up at the same time. Yeah, but there would love me. There were fun things that something I would never have written and never done. But gosh, it was handled well. So there have been a lot of them over the years. Um, 
I don't think I'm the great greatest writer in the world. I think most of the people who write books for the realms are better writers than me. So I can enjoy every time I open a book. There have been a few books where I disagreed with where the author went or they didn't end well in both the writing sense as the story sense. But by and large, I've enjoyed them all. Um, I think it has been unfortunate at times that some of the editorial direction of the company has been aiming for a, oh, we're writing for young boys. You know, it's like, no, no, guys, we're writing for everybody. Have you paid attention at Gen Con? They come in all sizes, ages, genres, genders, whatever, you know, write for everybody. I mean, the young boys get everything done for them. How about the young girls? Which is why I had Spellfire and so on with female protagonists. And I had to fight them every inch of the way. No, 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 you should be writing about boys. Nobody cares about girls. And I said, and isn't that a problem? But by and large, I, I don't think we've had too many real stinkers at Realms novels. I've enjoyed them. So, Question for Elminster. Mm. I wondered when someone would finally come to their senses. Yes. <laughs> How's Ali Astri doing these days? Very well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Elminster doesn't like to talk shop because you'll have to get into specifics of magic use and maybe. Hi there. I have a question for uh, Elminster and then a small one for Ed. Uh, as a fellow wizard, uh, what is your favorite spell to use? Why? And. Uh, what is the most unique way you've used it? And then for uh, Ed, uh, can I get some things signed after the words? <laughs> okay, so Ed will answer first. Sure, of course you can. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm, I'm sure they need the room for something else, so we may have to move out into the corridor, but I will sign. That's no problem. Okay, from Minster. I don't have favorites. Every spell is a wonderful spell. But I find in my recent adventures in the land of Amaria, um, I seem to have evolved a favorite spell, and that spell is disintegrate. <laughs> because as I get older, I find I have less and less patience for villains warbling on about how they're going to destroy the world after they disembowel me. So I just cut the process short. And the most unique way I've used Disintegrate? Yes, well, there is a weapon used in Kalimshan called the Slingshit. <laughs> this is where you take the <clears throat> refuse of an entire city, you place it in large vats to mature for some months, and then when someone is besieging you, you sling the vats. So I just integrated the vats before they could be slung. <laughs> Having been a creator for uh, a very, very long time. Can everybody hear me? No. Okay. Um, oh, I guess it might be for, yeah, for the Um So as a creator for a very, very long time, um, what would you, what advice would you give to someone who is maybe perhaps starting their career or their their first venture into being a creative and and doing these types of things um i guess that's pretty much it <laughs> okay yeah my advice would be do what you love because if you don't love doing it it's going to become a slog very quickly and if you're being paid for it it's going to become a job you hate and if you're not being paid for it you're inevitably just going to bog down and leave it after a bit so if you're doing what you love do it and at the beginning, don't care about getting paid or anything. Care about doing it until you feel satisfied that you've created something and you could say, yeah, that's half decent. That's as good as, as most things I bought and paid. Okay, now I know I can do it. Now, find somebody who will publish you. And the somebody will always have hurdles. Like, yeah, we need you to do this. No, I mean, don't do the intern thing that American business loves. We'd like you to work for sle free slave labor for 20 years, and then maybe we'll give you a job. No, no. But I mean, if they say, well, you have to, you have to write for this anthology, or you have to write this test piece, do it. 
It's just like school where they make you jump through the hurdles and you think these dickish people, but the hurdles are there for a reason. So do the hurdles and then say, okay, I feel good about this. Now, you are blessed to live in the golden age of you can now self-publish. You can go out on Amazon and write weird books. I was molested by a velociraptor. It's an entire genre that only exists on Amazon. Um, or you can, you know, but then you have to be aware if you're doing gaming stuff or you're writing what is essentially fanfic that you don't cross the line and it's something you'll get sued for. So yet if you want to write Star Trek or Star Wars or Realms fanfic, do it and then file the serial numbers off and make it your own. And do it until you feel better. Okay, how would my own be different than write it different? Now you're a writer. You're a creator. You're doing it. And that's the easiest way. And then if there are going to be people who you want to publish you in whatever your genre is, gathered together in one place, like, say, here at Gen Con, walk the exhibit hall, talk to those people, take your measure of them. Are they dicks? Would you never want to work with them? Or do you like them? Good, now you know who to call. Network, get their business card, jump through their hurdles because they will be there, and then do it, and you're in. Um, I mean, I'm not the right person to ask for advice because I started designing games before there was a game writing field, you know? Uh, so everything was different for me. And fantasy is the oldest literature form ever written, you know? So I was writing fantasy long after other people read it. But the publishing in North America, in English, has changed completely from when I was a little kid. But it's the self-publishing gives you the chance to publish, to, to make an end run around the gatekeepers. So, yeah, that would be my advice. And so um, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for coming. If we could give Ed just one big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. If we could give Elminster just a small round of applause, just a really small one. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> but of course.